Thank you so much. I'm really glad to be joining you both here, Rachel and Alma. Um, Rachel, thank you for the land acknowledgement. I want to add to that because I am actually on a different land and I want to acknowledge that as well. Uh, so I am Jennifer Rittner. I use she pronouns and this is a, obviously also prepared. So forgive me for reading it, uh, but it does come from my heart as I wrote it. As we are about to talk about building equity within our spaces, we have to begin by acknowledging the historical space we are all occupying. American cities were founded on the exclusions and erasures of many indigenous peoples. And even in the context of a virtual convening, the technologies that make this meeting possible penetrate both the earth and air that has been stewarded for generations before the onset of settler colonialism. The land of the five boroughs that make up New York City, where I am standing, are the traditional homelands of the Lenape, Merrick, Canarsie, Matinecock, and Rockaway nations. Despite systemic erasures, these lands persist as intertribal trade lands under the stewardship of many nations and over 115,000 intertribal Native Americans, First Nations, and Indigenous peoples who currently call New York City home. Again, as we discuss design as a collective practice, we should consider what it means to dismantle the ongoing legacies of settler colonialism in our practices, because this is our collective ethical responsibility. And in addition, I would like to acknowledge those of us who are here today, because our ancestors did not arrive on these lands of our own free will, and whose tremendous cultural, economic, and technological contributions are among the legacies we all continue to carry. So with that in mind, and, I, and Rachel, I, I have to say, I really um, appreciate you amending or adding to the land acknowledgement to say that when we read these out, they become sort of de rigueur and then we can ignore them. And so the question and the challenge to all of us is to continually ask, what does it mean to build these into our practices? And so I start here by saying that when I was invited to give this talk, I was invited to give a solitary talk. And that seems unnatural to me. I'm not really interested in that. <laughs> I think that that's um, it reinforces or reifies the idea of the sort of soul expert. And my expertise, it barely isn't being me. Uh, and everything else is a conversation. So I'm very happy to join in the conversation with you, but as well to acknowledge that the conversations we're having are conversations that we have had with our ancestors and with our role models and our mentors. And so I want us to start by just naming the people into this space who are part of the conversations we are having through our practices. And I wanna extend that, uh, that invitation also as we are doing this work among the three of us to everyone who is in the audience to kindly put in the chat the name of a person you are carrying into your practice or into the space with you. And if you would like, I will start. Should I start us off? Um, as, as many people who have heard me speak in the last few months know, my mother became an ancestor in June and her legacy is one that I am carrying very heavily with me in the moment. Her name was Bernadette Clemente Maria de Souza Rittner, um, which actually is getting harder to say because I'm saying it somehow less often, which I don't really understand. Um, but Bernadette was born in Brazil of a mother who was indigenous, her name was Dianqui, and a father who was of African descent. And both of her parents spoke languages that they did not pass on to her. And she spoke a language that she did not pass on to me. And so part of the legacy that I'm carrying is a legacy of broken communications um, and also of trying to reach back and find some way of knowing about a past that I don't have a language for. Um, and that is an ongoing effort that I, I don't know that I'll ever really resolve. Can I pass it on to you, Alma? Yes. Um... Hi, I'm Alma. I'm very um, happy to be here. Thank you, Rachel, for inviting me. Um, I guess something or like someone or it's, I don't really have one person who I really have, who I like try to bring into my work or just in general. But um, I do think about like my family also, like specifically like my mom's side who I didn't really get to know because, you know, unfortunately, because like the way the borders and laws and immigration laws just like didn't really like it prevented my family and I to like sort of visit like back and forth. And so 
now as like an adult, I like, I do try to like be in communication with them or like learning more about how my mother grew up and like more of her culture and like how I can sort of maybe pass that along to my child now that I'm a mom. I'm, I have a four-year-old now and sort of like reconnect there and sort of like understand my mom a little more too as well. So that's where I, I come from. Thanks, Alma. I think on that note, the names that I wanted to bring into our conversation tonight are Molly and Isaac. They're actually the names of my children rather than the names of ancestors. Though in the Jewish tradition, we name children for ancestors. Um, so in a way they represent that lineage. But I think that in my practice, both in the classroom and also creatively and professionally, um, since having children, I think a lot about I don't know, the, the impact of what I do on future generations um, and trying to um, weigh that value when, you know, when making decisions um, and to act responsibly to uh, my children and all the children and their children and so on, so. Yeah, and I, I'm really struck by, you know, the word responsibility here, and, and I think that it's, it really is important to center that, the responsibility we share to be collective in our, not just, you know, design is a collective act, there is no such thing as design that is entirely solitary, you're designing with a client in mind, with a user in mind, with a community in mind, um, but often uh, we we sort of separate that from the action that we are engaged in, right? We sit down and if you are designing, it feels solitary in moments, um, punctuated by moments of interaction with others. So what does it mean to, to hold more closely the others in our practices? I wanted to, if you don't mind, um, and I hope this is not disruptive, but I, I do want to, Ricardo Gomez, hello. Oh, it's so nice to see you here. Um, the, to invite people to please share names in the chat because I want us to acknowledge that by putting the names together in this space, we're weaving them together, right? And so it might seem abstract, but there's a tremendous power in putting our names together in these spaces. I wanted to share something that I had read many years ago when I was actually a graduate student, which seems like an eternity ago. And it was from a, a book called The One and the Many. And I've continued to, to use it, even though the author perhaps has some politics that I don't agree with. But I, I'm going to really I, it kind of reflect on the meaning of collective that he is offering. And he tells a story. So it'll take, it'll take about a minute. There was once, so Schopenhauer tells us, a colony of porcupines. Do you know this one, Rachel? Are you familiar with this? OK. They were wont to huddle together on a warm, excuse me, on a cold winter's day, thus wrapped in communal warmth, escape being frozen. But plagued by the pricks of each other's quills, they drew apart. And every time the desire for warmth brought them together again, the same calamity overtook them. Thus they remained distracted between two misfortunes, able neither to tolerate nor to do without one another until they discovered that when they stood at a certain distance from one another, they could both delight in, in one another's individuality and enjoy one another's company. They did not attribute any metaphysical significance to this distance, nor did they imagine it to be an independent source of happiness, like finding a friend. They recognized it to be a relationship in terms not of substantive enjoyments, but of contingent considerabilities that they must determine for themselves unknown to themselves, they had invented civil association. And so I, I carry that because I think that this is the delicate negotiation many of us are, are doing between our individual needs and the needs of the collective and how that shows up in our work is often tricky. How do we, in working with the needs and demands of clients, with the considerations and if you will, empathies for communities and a desire to be full in ourselves, in our, in our aesthetic vision, in our ethical considerations. How do we negotiate those delicate balances between the individual and the collective? I wonder, Rachel, if you can help us work through some of that. Yeah, I think it, I, I mean, I'm, I'm reflecting on 
you know, in our framing for this lecture series that there's this um, thread running through the lectures this fall about um, this, um, I guess, rejection of, of the story of the lone wolf yeah. genius creative designer and recognition that the problems of today and all days are too complex for that story, you know, and that more minds and more perspectives are needed if, if design is going to have the impact it promises, you know, and, and also that the, this um, beloved notion of designer as problem solver or, you know, group of designers as problem solvers, I think also needs to be reexamined, you know, because it's not about a group of experts concocting a solution and then laying it on a community without really knowing or being of that community or finding a way to be authentic um, and be responsible um, to that community. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Alma, I wonder if as, as a more recent graduate of the program, if you feel as though in going out into the, the workplace that you are challenged to find your, your individual place in your practice, is this, is this a tension you have felt? Oh, yeah, <clears throat> definitely. I've, I think right off the bat, as soon as I graduated, I sort of, um, you know, you're new, you're very like nervous about like um, your new workplace, your new boss. And I was still sort of trying to find like my voice and like my design, like aesthetic and like my, just like find me, I guess, as a person. And there have been times where, you know, I, I mean, in my background, I have experience working in like small design studios and startups, um, mostly like tech. And when I often, I found myself in workplaces where it was like, I was usually the only person of color on the team or like in the whole company really. And when I would go into those kind of places, I would definitely feel like so out of place. I felt like sort of like the tension of like of being different or like being an outsider. But now that I'm like, like, now that I'm a lot more like confident in what I do or in like my work and like I know that like now that I know that I do good work and like people have been able to recognize that and I sort of have been able to find my place and like to be just like just trust my gut more and like trust um myself because my experience has definitely made like is a very different point of view than like say my my peers and like I think that your experience or you know everyone has a very distinct point of view everyone grew up really differently and I think everyone should value that and you should really like own you know your where you came from and like what you've been through because that is what makes what it will make you stand out and that's what like I feel like good leadership would like keep an eye out for you know when they're out for looking for candidates and you know and such like that. You know, Alma, what you just made me think of is, and I've never seen this in a design studio, and I wonder if it exists, and I just haven't seen it, but um, a, a some form of cultural sharing that happens in studio practices where people actually just get to to present and share and, and narrate and, and uh, sort of collaboratively discuss, if you will, the various influences and inspirations that we're carrying because I think that they they do tend to get lost you know often when we're designing for client briefs the client brief doesn't have anything particular to do with our heritage and so the question of heritage often gets lost in client work although we find ways to incorporate it perhaps in more personal projects and so it feels almost if you will um I, I don't know if it's inappropriate to say this so please correct me if this is an inappropriate way of saying it but it can feel somewhat um, schizophrenic, which is to say that it there is an either or, right? You can be the individual designer who brings in one's heritage, or you can be the designer who works for clients and that the client work uh, is purports to uh, uh, embrace a more universal approach to design, which is anesthetized of, of culture, if you will, or heritage. And I, I wonder if the way in which we teach design, again, reinforces that perspective. Do we critique students around questions of taste and therefore 
prevents them from being whole in how they're bringing their personal aesthetic visions into their into their work as they're developing their voices as designers. I mean, I wonder, Rachel, if we can think talk about that as educators. And I say that as somebody who does not teach studio at all, I teach mostly design history and issues in design. Um, but what does it mean for studio practitioners? Yeah, I love I love that question. It's a question that I'm kind of become obsessed with as an educator. I think um, it's for me it, um, really started when I realized that everyone I think is famous is someone that my students have literally never heard of. Um, oh. Like if I were to say to a student, <laughs> like name a famous movie star, you know, in my mind, I'm going to date myself. I'm like, who's, who, who's the first person who comes to mind when you say name a famous movie star? Like for some reason it's Brad Pitt. Brad Pitt. I don't like, know why. Tom Cruise or Meryl Streep. I don't know. Right. Like, but it's like, I, like I will have students who will have never heard of Brad Pitt and good for them, for God's sake, who needs to hear another thing about Brad Pitt? And they will have someone in their mind who I have not heard of, you know, or if I'm like, what are you listening to? Like, what are you, what song are you obsessed with? It's going to be different from my song. And like, um, initially I felt kind of alienated by that. Like, oh my gosh, like we don't know each other at all. Mm -hmm. um, but soon I became excited about that. Like, mm -hmm. wow, what can I learn about what's interesting about and relevant to culture for my students because as a designer if I don't know about what's interesting and relevant <laughs> yeah. I'm all washed up right so yeah, yeah. yeah I, I don't know I think and it's I a, wonder a, the, oh sorry Rachel I'm please, sorry uh, um you know I, that that's a really interesting point about the this sort of generational shift and yeah I think that again, part of the, the practice of like thinking about who we're bringing into spaces is the generational shift of the new, but also what we're carrying from this past, right? And so I just wonder if, so I'll, I'll talk just briefly about a design history class that I was teaching, not at CCA. And, you know, one of the biggest challenges in teaching design history is that it tends to begin with modernism and then move forward from there, which is absurd because design has happened since the beginning of human civilization. So, you know, how could you start with modernism? Um, but if you start with modernism, then you're starting with European modernism and there's nothing wrong with European modernism, but it is not all there is. It doesn't encompass all there is about design. And so how then do you teach this in a way that allows the many to be heard, uh, to be seen, to be experienced, to be understood, right? To be interrogated. And I can't do that because I don't have all of the information, all of the knowledge. I'm not a textbook. I mean, am I, you know, I would even say I'm, I'm fairly limited in my knowledge of global design history, extremely limited in my perspective on global design history. But what I do have and what I did have for those semesters were students who were coming from different parts of the world who had design influences and interests that they could bring into the space. And so the way I taught the class was around a series of themes and asked students and, and provided some resources to archive, some links to archives that they could then use um, to search for images and design artifacts that reflected how they saw design. And therefore we could have a much more heterogeneous view of design that we could unpack together, which is to say that we could acknowledge what design looks like, the principles of design that were present in the object. We could talk about users broadly. Um, we could talk about context or socio-cultural context. We could talk about the time period, right? We could talk about influences before and since, technologies and so on. Um, but we had to unpack that together and therefore we had to see closely together. We had to ask each other what we were seeing. And none of us could be the expert in the room who was saying this is good or bad or right or wrong or important or unimportant, which I think actually is maybe the more salient challenge is to say this is important. Um, and therefore everything that isn't said is unimportant. Um, and then it gives everybody an opportunity to see the unboundedness of the history of design, right? Mm -hmm. To detach it from a linear narrative. So I think that there is a way in which studio practices, or I wonder if there's a way in which studio practices are doing that kind of work, which is to say, to show what are you bringing into the space rather than for an, any instructor, 
and I, myself included to say, this is what you should know, but rather if this is what you're bringing, how do we engage with that together? Alma, I, I wonder if you can talk as somebody who recently gradu graduated, not so recently, but relatively recently, um, what it felt like for you to be uh, a student, not to call out anyone, good, bad, or otherwise, but to say, what did it feel like to be a student and to have the space to interrogate or investigate your own cultural experience or vision or, or inspiration? I mean, I mean, looking back at my experience, <clears throat> I'm very fortunate to say that I had a pretty good experience. I had professors who really like were very supportive of the work that I wanted to do in, in college, and I'm very grateful for that. Um, but I do want to also acknowledge that I do know students who didn't have that, um, that privilege, unfortunately, because of, you know, the professors are very like traditional or like, you know, are very um, I guess, like, have very different point of views or certain, you know, different point of views. And so, um, but as for me, I, you know, I, I guess I'm just, I, I was really grateful to really experiment with what I wanted to do and like what, um, I mean, now that I'm looking back at the work that I did at CCA, I, I, can, I can say that like, oh, like, oh, maybe I could have done that differently. Or maybe like, I, I can see that I've grown a lot since my time at CCA. And I think um, that's a good thing. And, and I feel like CCA really helped me sort of um, really open up that sort of like, I want to say like, like my point, like I feel like at CCA, I, I really, started to kind of grow my point of view and then as I like progress out into the real world I feel like I had a backbone I could fall into like all the work I did at CCA and then I like sort of like grew more from there and like sort of oh now I think this way and now I think that way and yeah that was sort of like my um my uh, my experience and I think if I can recall I think Rachel joined me potentially I think the last my last year there which um I think Rachel really did change our graphic design program from what I remember. Like, I remember you were really advocating for like um, getting more women professors, getting more like people of color. And I just want to say, I really like, appreciate that. And I could only imagine how CCA has grown now. I, I feel like there's probably a lot more um, like diversity, even not only with the students, but I feel like even with the professors, if I'm not wrong, like I think it's been slowly, but it's been slowly growing, but I think that it's starting to head in that direction, which I think has, yeah. which is very um, beneficial for the students and the school too. Yeah. So I think, you know, what you just raised as an important part of the, the question of collectivity is who, who is in the room who speaks to these new ways of designing and teaching and interpreting and seeing the world. Um, but then how do we build a new practice with the new people, right? Because I think that in some ways, the, the, what has become the traditional way of teaching design needs to have some radical shift. And so how do we make that shift to more collective practices? I, I think, I wonder if there is a way in which no studio class should be taught by a single practitioner. And now I can imagine that this is for all kinds of reasons, financial reasons in particular, seems impossible. But again, if what we are saying is that design is not a solitary practice, design is a collective practice, we know this, then how is the structure of design pedagogy actually modeling how design not only does happen in the real world, but should happen better in the real world? There are design collectives, studio practices that are design collectives, that are trying harder and harder, more and more to situate themselves within the context of community. And I'll just continue this for one more second, Rachel, and then I wanna to come to you with this question. But, you know, the, the, and maybe we talked about this the other day, but I think that, you know, traditionally we can see design as in service of a product, right? You design to make a thing, which shifts to design as a service. So designers responding to, in some way, thinking through the systems and services that are um, essential or what have you, but the design as a, as a sort of a service practice, not just as a maker of product. But do we, and I hope this is, I'm not being extremely clear now, but 
that I see this evolution from design as product to design as service to moving forward to design as a pedagogy, which is to say to bring back an older traditional practice in which those who have the expertise of design teach others how to design because to know how to design is to build agency for oneself. That to have the tools of design is to have the tools to repair or restore what has been broken by imperialist design. So you can't teach people to be agents of their own, right, their own worlds, their own communities by bringing people in to do that work either for or with them, but you can do it by building the capacities within communities, workforce capacity, skill capacities, uh, spaces, where people can be making things because we are all design. I mean, we know this, right? We are all designers. So time immemorial, we're all designers. And so I wonder what does it look like to actually have pedagogical practices that are actually building new pedagogical practices of design? Does that make sense? That was a very long way of sort of expressing that. I mean, it, it was so much and it was all so rich. I'm like nodding my little head off here. Uh, so, oh gosh, I mean, it makes me think about some of Ellen Lupton's work, trying to kind of demystify the tools of design and to say, you know, it's so funny when non-designers are like, so what tools do you use? Like, mm. and they say, you know, I have Photoshop, but I'm sure you're using some super fancy extra expert version of Photoshop. And I'm like, no, it's the same Photoshop, you know, it, like the literally, literally the tools, the software applications are available to all and usable by all. And I think, you know, to uh, at a deeper level, like the, you know, the methods of the designer and the mindset of the designer are, I think, what is, is even more valuable than those tools, right? And I think that's right. what needs to be socialized and shared and not locked up as if it's right. this sort of precious, I don't know, precious protected commodity. Right. Um, and I love what you're saying about the, the importance of team teaching. And we've been exploring this at CCA a lot in a class, a new class that we have called Studio Forward, which is team taught. And it's a mix of grad and undergrad students from different design disciplines. And it's hard because we're asking and expecting the students to collaborate in teams. Yeah. And they, you know, they haven't built those muscles. And fortunately, the faculty team is strong so that they can model how it is that you be a productive porcupine. <laughs> yeah. um, but I'm curious, I'd love, you know, sort of practically speaking also, I'd love to hear Jennifer and Alma, like how collaboration works for you, you know, like the collective, it means multiple people, multiple minds, multiple opinions, you know, like what, Jennifer, how have you been able to find success so often in collaboration? And Alma, what have you seen in your work? Yeah, I'll let, let me start by saying that um, I, I think that the most important element in what you're asking is time, because what can't happen is people encounter each other for the first time and know how to work with one another, that collaborative work requires trust and it requires vulnerability and it requires time to to flourish for people to recognize each other's skills and talents and expertise and 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 challenges and it requires a willingness to be imperfect with one another and to ask for help i actually think that the hardest thing the thing that we have not learned to do and i and myself as well is to learn how to ask for help mm -hmm. um, to learn how to be vulnerable to say i genuinely don't know how to do this and then to build within that structures that are non-punitive so that when people don't know what they're doing and haven't asked for help, they are not then penalized for not doing the things that they knew they couldn't do anyway, but didn't know how to ask. So how do we actually dismantle a system of penalties that asks people to be perfect all the time? Um, and how do we build time into a process that is not as artificial as I think it is now in the context of a class and a semester and a and a and a year and a you know and a program, how do we actually from beginning to end model the messiness of building together even when we don't know what we're building together? And 
and invite students who have not learned to express agency to um, not just encourage, but nudge them to, to, to discover the voice, to ask people to come in and make things with them that they're not even sure about, right? And that is not an assignment, right? It, it's not something you can learn in a semester. I think it's, it's a lifelong process. You know, some of the great collaborations that I have seen among people do feel like marriages in a good sense, in that they, they've learned each other's so here, I'll say something super personal in the, that's not that personal, but I think that's a weird thing to say in a forum like this, is that um, I, I have always said that I could never have married somebody I couldn't fart in front of. Because you need to be like at your grossest, not that farting is gross, but like, you know, you need to be your most honest and natural with the person you're going to spend your life with, right? And so the same thing goes within these collective spaces where we're, we need to be vulnerable with one another, right? We need to make design that or have ideas that are kind of like weird and messy and don't make sense and, and, and then grow from that. And I think that we are so still built into competition. We're still built into taste making, who made it better, who is going to be validated for their work, who's going to get the award, um, who's right, who's getting the validation, the competition of it, but also the urgency of getting the grade and finishing the course. I think it prevents us from actually being able to model this work in this collective way that I think we need to. Um, and by the way, we do this to communities. We walk into communities and we set timetables that are unnatural and we tell them to trust us unnaturally. And then we, t and then, you know, we, and, and this, you know, again, this whole thing about collective agreements is really interesting because a collective agreement can't be delivered to you. It has to be something you are co-authoring. And if you're not co-authoring it, then it's just another form of imperialism. It's just telling people how to act. It's not actually inviting people to self-determine what is meaningful to them and how they are building trust together. So collective action, in my view, is something that we have to build with a lot of pain and a lot of discomfort, um, but also by, by tearing away some of the structures that continue to, con to constrain, i.e. time, um, how, you know, how we are coming together. Thank you. Um, awesome. Alma, how do you, because something that you don't get a lot of experience of at CCA is like learning how to work on teams and learning how to represent points of view outside of your own. Like, how have you learned that in professional practice? Oh, it's been an ongoing battle. <laughs> no, I mean, it was definitely hard in the beginning, you know, like I've never really worked in a team setting like that until I went out into the workforce. And so, I mean, now I work with, I mean, I don't just work with other designers. I mostly work with non-designers who are copywriters or like producers and um, strategists and, um, you know, all these different stakeholders. So, I mean, it's definitely been a trial and error. It hasn't been perfect. I've <laughs> made plenty of mistakes and have learned and grown from them. Um, but really, it just takes experience and it takes practice. And um, if you have the right people around you, like in your team who are, you know, unfortunately I have faced, you know, people who weren't like very collective, weren't really understanding, like it, it created, or I've been in environments where it was really hard for me to like speak up and like ask for help. And, um, but I've also have experienced great environments where like they really encourage that and they really like are very supportive. And so um, it really is just like, has been a, a learning experience and I mean I'm still learning today I mean I'm I'm not perfect at all and I feel like at the as the more I've you know I've been practicing it the more comfortable I am and also like like your management is also a really huge part of it and I feel like if you're a manager or your director specifically the people who you are closely work with if they're very understanding and they're very supportive and you will also grow and you will also get better at communication with the team as well. Yeah, yeah. I, um, I, there's, um, I'm hedging because it's, I, I don't know how this is gonna be received. So I think there's a case to be made that when people talk about building 
diversity and inclusion in spaces. What they're doing is asking black and brown and other marginalized people to join into white spaces. And with, with the assumption that that will make all of us better or that we can thrive there. And I think that as some of my colleagues are aware, we're often harmed more in those spaces where we have to conform in ways and perform in ways that do not allow us to thrive. And there are designers and, and, and people in, well, people in design who have argued for more segregated spaces to find new structures, new collectives that allow us not to have to perform for others, for those who have power and privilege, that define what is the new. And I, I think there's something really powerful in that notion of rejecting the spaces that feel that they can be made more whole by our diversities in honor of building things that are entirely new, that we define from the, you know, from the bottom up. I think that the call for segregation is, is challenging because we have been told that diversity is a value we should care about, but it has taken so long for institutions of power to invite us in that sometimes when we do come in now, it's just too little, not enough, and not in ways that are actually conducive. So I do think that one of the challenges that larger institutions have to ask is, um, hmm, what is, or what may, or maybe what we have to ask of our institutions is, if you are inviting me in, what are you doing to change other than just making a seat at the table for me? Right. Um, and that's a that's a big ask. And I think it's it's not even just an ask. I think it's a demand that the collective can't happen just because we now have a seat. That's only one very small step. I am recognizing that it is 846. Oh, excuse me, on my time, because I'm still in Lenape land time, which is here on the East Coast. So it is 846 for me. But that does mean that we have a little under 15 minutes. We do not have any questions in the chat. I don't know if it's because um, we're not interesting enough for people to want to ask us questions or, uh, or some other thing. But I hope that there are questions that people want to ask. And I'm gonna look in the chat. There's not anything in the chat, although I, some of some people did share names and I thank you for doing that. Uh, but we can keep talking if there's nothing in the chat or in the Q and A. Yeah, we'll keep talking until someone interrupts us and we might keep talking all night because um, <laughs> that would be my dream. So I wanna acknowledge Jennifer, yeah. what, you, what you just shared, because I think it's, it's profound and crucial um, and true. Um, and um, uh, I, you know, I reflect on um, summer 2020 and the Where Are the Black De Designers Conference where there were some really important conversations that I think explored and pushed this question of, you know, um, if you're gonna invite me into your space, you better make sure it's a space I wanna be. Yeah. You know, because that invitation is going to fall flat if I get there and it's awful, you know, or, you know, those of us in design education who've watched that show, The Chair, uh, Netflix, which made waves in certain it. small communities, yeah. you know, I think tried to explore some of those questions as well. Yeah. Um, and, you know, what you were sharing reminded me of, so I've been involved with a group at CCA called Decolonial School, mm. um, which is a faculty initiative to try to you know, educate ourselves um, about decolonial pedagogy and practices. And in our first year, it was all one big group and anyone who wanted to join could join. And in our second year, um, the decision was made actually that there should be two tracks initially. There should be a track for white people and a track for mm. people of color because different work needed to be done in those different groups. The white people needed to understand and unsettle white supremacy. And the people of color needed some space and peace and quiet to talk mm -hmm. about decolonization. <laughs> mm -hmm. And then after a, you know, a few months and a few sessions, maybe we could come together and be ready 
to yeah. be in community together. And it was a really important insight. And it was hard for people to, to face that. Yeah. But I think it was important. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I know that Ricardo was here and I think I saw Jacqueline Francis is here. Hi, Jacqueline. Um, and, and some of the conversations and I, I have not spoken to them as often as I would like to, but you know, many of us who are talking about these things across various universities and institutions, you know, I think that we are finding each other and that is helping us to advance a conversation about what are our demands and what are our needs and that they're, they're all very different. Look, I'm a biracial woman, right? I have proximities to whiteness that are very particular and that, in as I was actually talking with a student just yesterday about is there's a way in which I have not had to seek permission to be in white spaces um, and have not had to permission to be in black spaces and have been made uncomfortable in both right so that there is a lot of um, negotiating our own personal experiences yes Janelle it was you I didn't want to name you in case you know that felt private but yes it was you Janelle um, that the you know the way we are navigating these spaces is very particular to each other um, and and that we are not people of color as a solid right uh, experience certainly not as one single uh, type of experience so even within that grouping you will have arguments and and uh and different views on what it means for each of us to thrive and to see each other as allies and as in solidarity with one another um helen maria are there any examples of educational programs that are already teaching design in these new ways well i mean i think it's happening in in a lot of in a lot of places i i, I hope that many of our colleagues are Look, you know, the the program that, um, why am I forgetting his name? Silas Monroe started, and I'm forgetting what he's calling it. Does anybody remember what he's calling it? Um, not decolonizing uh, history. BIPOC but, design history. Oh, that's the one, mm -hmm. BIPOC design history, right? You know, I think that the way in which he is building that is approaching the telling, the teaching of design history differently. Uh, bringing people with different expertise together to advance their own scholarship. And yet, I still think that it is still somewhat individualized, right? Individual people telling their versions of, it's, it's hard to do collective teaching. I have to say, I, I don't know if this is answering your question, Helen Maria, because I don't know the answer to your question right off the top of my head. Yes, I think people are doing it. And I, I wish I could just like name all of them right now and I'm struggling to do so. Um, I am actually teaching a class at Parsons that is co-taught and it's one of my favorite things because we have all of these rich conversations, just the two of us together separately. And then we come into the class and because we are discussing these issues together, it's also, it's another class in contemporary issues and design, because we are having the conversations, more students feel more empowered to ask their questions because they also see how we are coming into our these these topics with different expertise or questions or knowledge um, or concerns, right? I won't say we argue, but we certainly disagree with one another as well. And that modeling those kinds of respectful disagreements has been very useful. I think this, the amount of dialogue that happens in the room to me is exhilarating. Um, I'm, I'm just looking at the chat here. I don't know if I answered the question. It's possible that I didn't. I find that you, Jenny, I find that I currently hesitate to include white men into the fold because they had occupied so much space in history. Am I practicing reverse discrimination or am I promoting more space for diversity? How to navigate fairly? <sighs> yeah, I mean, that's a good question, right? What, what is reverse discrimination? No, I, I don't believe in reverse discrimination. I, I just, as conceptually, I reject the idea of reverse discrimination. You can feel free to disagree with me. I, I reverse discrimination. Look, you know, the the way power works, the way power is held historically and in the present. You individually making choices about not including men into whatever fold you are are uh, holding does not do a societal harm. 
So I, I don't know. I, I don't think that you should worry about reverse discrimination. I just don't believe in reverse discrimination. I'm not saying that, you know, women can be anti-male, men can be anti-male, people of all genders can be anti-everything, people of all races can be anti-discriminatory of, of all kinds of things. But I think it's different to be individually discriminatory and find within the spaces where you are being discriminating, which is different from discriminatory, but discriminating, um, if you find in those spaces that you can thrive in your practice, then you are, you are making a, a space that can be safe for others who feel similarly. Um, do I, I don't want to, I don't believe that white men should not be in design or should not have leadership roles when they are doing that work responsibly and respectfully and with an eye toward dismantling the ways in which systemically they have been allowed to hold power inequitably where others could also hold power or, and, or do it better. I just, you know, when somebody says, well, you know, well, do, do you want to be the head of the thing that this person has been the head of or that white men have been the head of? No, because I don't like the way they're holding power. I don't think that that's useful. I think that a lot of the, 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 the um, you know, the structures of power and the titles of power and all of the ways in which we've structured this, it's all useless. I don't want any, you know, I don't think most of us want that. I think some of us want it because we've been told it's what we should want. Am I going off on a tangent here? But no. Oh, so, you know, so, okay. So I, you know, I think what we're not saying is I want to dismantle it so that white men don't hold power, but we have it. I want to dismantle it because it's not working. And the collective isn't about on us being on top. It's about smashing hierarchies that are, are damaging. I mean, look, you know, the idea that we have invented a society in which people have to beg for basic services to be housed, to be clothed, to be fed, to have clean water, that we actually continue to perpetrate a, a social system in which people have to ask permission to be human is absurd. So it's not working. So that has nothing to do with whether a white person is on top or a black person is on top or a biracial person that is on top. It, whoever's on top is, is perpetuating a failed system. All right, sorry, that was a little bit of a tangent. When confronted with microaggressions, racism or discrimination within an institution, what is your favorite practice that you see the most success in a progressive forward manner where change happens or seems possible? When confronted by microaggressions, <laughs> Janelle, I am, I am like weirdly, I, I think I am more blind to the microaggressions than I should be because I've just, they've, I've, they've so, they, I just have stopped hearing them. Uh, <sighs> microaggressions. All right, well, I, we have three minutes, but I'll tell you this very quickly, this little story. So my mother, as you know, was from Brazil. She has an accent of a person who grew up in another country. And for all of her life, I have had to listen to people say they don't understand her. And that was never about her and always about them choosing not to hear her, but mainly choosing to make her know that they think they can't understand her, right? That's, a, that's the microaggression that she dealt with her entire life. How do you deal with that? Um, you can't change the way other people behave toward you. They don't know that you have heard that stupid question 3,000 times, and they don't realize the degree to which it has become the narrative of your existence, right? Um, the word exotic, which gets used at people like us constantly, they, do, they think it's a compliment. How are you going to convince them that that actually is a fetishization that is, is damaging to your psyche. How can you move forward in a progressive manner? It's not, it's, you're not gonna like it. I think you just tune it out. That is not a good answer. I'm sure there's a better answer and a different person would give you a much better answer than that, Janelle. But I, I think there's just a way in which you cannot change other people's perceptions and 
your the choice is to to whether or not you will continue to to hear them that's a generic answer to a big question that probably has a better answer in the specific alma do you have a favorite practice for turning a microaggression on its head i mean i'm just like jennifer i mean there's not really much like you can't change like yeah i agree you can't change what they think of you um but you could you know, because I mean, I obviously I have heard microaggressions in the workplace, like, unfortunately, and yeah, at first they do like, you know, they're going to get to you at first, but you know, as time goes on, it's like, I just ignore them as well. And like, I just like, um, I try to ignore them and try to avoid them as much as I can. And I no relationship there. I'm not even trying to be friendly with you or just, just strictly work. <laughs> um, that's just how I would deal. But Alma, right, doesn't it reinforce the extent to which we need spaces where we do not have to be confronted with that? Like that's what it means to be able to thrive is to not be in spaces where people do not have that the sensitivity to the microaggressions that they perpetrate. Um, we are all imperfect. We all have said things that we regret. And we look back and we think, ooh, that was a little, even just in this last hour, I've said a couple of things that I was like, it <laughs> wasn't so appropriate. And so, you know, we are imperfect, but I think there's a difference between creating spaces where that imperfection is, is, um, is understood within a context of care, right? That we are caring for each other. And then we can say to each other, that made me really uncomfortable. Or, you know what, that, that word has been used against me. And I, I find it very, you know, it, it doesn't reflect how I feel about myself. And we can unpack the word together. What you can do in spaces where those conversations can't happen because we're not operating as equals, those are spaces where we cannot thrive. And therefore, we have to reject those spaces, right? And I think ultimately, that's really 